I, uh, I guess I'll start the way I typically do uh, and just talk about the preparation a little bit. Um, you know, I've, I've said often that I think the, the thing that you have to have in order to just give yourself a, a chance to have a successful draft is, is really good preparation. And I just want to applaud the efforts uh, of our group again. Uh, I think um, I think we've done an outstanding job. I think the process is a lot smoother now because we've got really good communication between our coaching staff and our scouting staff. I think everybody understands what we are asking them to do in their particular roles. Uh, and that, in my opinion, has uh, given us an excellent chance to, to have a great draft. And so uh, I've been very pleased with that part of it. Um, I do want to uh, personally and publicly acknowledge and thank a couple of men who are going to ride out in the sunset at the end of this draft. Um, some men who have been very, very valuable to me in my role as they have functioned in their roles. And those three gentlemen are, are Bobby Greer, uh, Ed Lambert, and Bob Beers, who will all be retiring at the end of, uh, at the end of this year. So, um, you know, Ed Lambert's a guy who, um, you know, a long time ago when I was a young coach, college football coach at the uh, AFCA convention, and I didn't know a soul uh, he's, uh, he's sitting in a, uh, in a hallway uh, in the, um, the convention lobby, and I didn't know anybody. And, and, and here's a, an established coach who's sitting with Jim Caldwell, a bunch of guys, and he invited me to sit down. And, and at that point, I kind of knew that I had a chance. And so it's been uh, with us, uh, you know, obviously for a very, very long time, started with him in Denver, and uh, just appreciate his wisdom and knowledge. And, and Bob Beers is another guy that was with us in Denver. He's just an old Gruffy football coach who's done an outstanding job of evaluating and identifying talent for us. And, and then Bobby Greer. Bobby has, has not been in the building over the last couple of years, but you know, I call Bobby the Oz because I would go and see him and, and tell Rita, if somebody's looking for him, I'm in the back at, at Bobby's office, and, and he's like the Wizard of Oz. And it's just been a, if it's just a valuable resource for me in, in the role and, and learning how to be a GM and just his help and his his perspective as it relates to just so many different things that, that come across my desk on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I just want to thank all those men and um, just let, make sure that they understand and know how valuable they've been uh, to, to my career. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Well, short of asking you who you're going to draft for the first pick, what is it like now, less than a week out, you've got your board, you've done all this prep, what's this like right now? Well, it's it's a good time, Mark. It's you know I feel really good about this board actually. Um, you know, like I said, the preparation I think has been all excellent, and um, you know at this point in time, this is a little bit earlier in the process with respect to this press conference than I typically do. But uh, the values have been set, the board is set, but that doesn't mean that there's still lots of conversation happening in, internally with respect to ranking and. Um, you know, just making sure that we have all the information that we that we need on on these guys. I feel good about this particular draft and this board in the sense that I think that there's depth throughout each round and throughout rounds one through seven at, at most positions. And so, uh, from a strategic standpoint, that's what we'll spend the next few days doing, making sure that we know exactly how we have them ordered, make sure that we know everything about them. But I feel like this, you know, last year, for example, as it relates to strategy, I felt like the the draft might might fall apart a little bit in, in the fourth and fifth round in the sense that I didn't think that we had enough players who were rated, you know, in those rounds. And I don't want I didn't want to get to the fourth or fifth round and start to have to take players that we had rated as the sixth and seventh rounders. And so strategically we looked at that and we said, okay, let's leverage those picks and let's let's move up in, in, in the earlier part of the draft so that we can, you know, get some players that we really feel good about. And we did that. We were able to execute that. We moved up and picked, took BMAC. We moved up and took Jalen. And so that's what we're doing now, Mark. We're just we're looking at at everything that we've got. We're making sure that, that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and, uh, and strategizing at this point as to what we think, what we need to do to execute, you know, on draft day. Wide receiver class. How much do you feel like you know, it's a strong and talented one? And uh, what do you think of just some of the people you know, at the top? Just you know, generally, uh, you know, the Will Fullers, the Corey Coleman's, the Treadwells, and that's like a Doxy. Yeah, I agree with you with respect to the your, your analysis of the group. I think it is a strong wide receiver class. I think I've said this. I said it in India. I think the quarterback class is a good class. I think the wide receiver class is a good class. There's some you know defensive men slash outside linebackers. There's several positions in this draft that we think there's depth um, throughout. And so, you know, I, I, I tend not to 
to talk individually about players, but I will I will agree with you about that. That you know, there's some good players in this draft at that, that position and then several. How much better do you feel going into a draft having already bolstered your roster through three days? Well, I mean, I feel I feel great about that. You know, we we have we have said and we have adopted and, and I, I hope um, practiced a philosophy where we don't. Um, draft based on need, right? So, um, you know, you, I think you've got to evaluate independently of that. And then I think you've got to have the discipline to, to, to exercise that, that philosophy as the draft happens. Um, but, you know, to, ha to have a, a football team that I really feel good about right now today, um, you know, at, 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 at virtually all the positions. And so to have that type of football team, I think it really gives us a chance to go and you know, go grab some guys who can make plays with the ball in their hand or who can go make plays on the ball, who can impact the football game. And that's what we intend to do. Wade Phillips once said that Bobby Greer was somebody who really pushed hard for J.J., kind of credited him with that. Do you remember that discussion, and do you remember his role in J.J. being selected again? Uh, just can't really. That's no Prince. That in the purple socks. No. <laughs> Listen, you know, There was a lot of talk about who, who picked J.J. We all picked J.J. J.J. was a, a great pick. Wasn't the only great pick that we've had in that room. Um, you know, as it relates to who had a, a, a stronger voice in any one particular pick, I, I don't necessarily remember that part of it. I don't even really think that that's important as much as I think it was a, a, a consensus in the room that he was a guy to take, and I'm glad we took him. Could you talk about the significance of the 40-yard dash? And is it changed through the years as far as the importance of the 40. I think the 40, John, it gives you the, the you know, we all want to know how fast a guy can run because speed, there, there's one thing you can't coach and that's speed. And so the 40 yard dash is an important element to, um, you know, to, to, you know, some of the ancillary things that we use to evaluate these players. The most important thing is play speed though because there are guys who can run a 40 yard dash and who train for the combine and do all those uh, techniques and all those things that 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 you know all these speed coaches and places are, are teaching these guys to do, and they can run a fast forty, but they don't play that fast. And so there's 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 two two different speeds that we look at. We try to estimate how fast a guy plays, you know, and then we want to know how fast he can run a forty. How just just straight out, how much speed does he have? But there are guys who run four four eight um, who play at four four eight that guys that run 4-3, that they don't play that fast. And so it's a part of it, but it's not the only thing. Has it ever come up about asking players to run in uniforms? No. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of conversation and talk about, you know, some of the things that we do at the Combine and how we are evaluating. Some of those drills may be antiquated, and we've actually had some, some discussions about, you know, um, how to update those drills a little bit, but, but I don't think that it's, it's realistic to expect that we'll have any kind of race or one that, that would include any kind of pads or anything like that. In terms of the defensive line, how tough is it to find three, four guys, and or are there a lot of them ones that you over and play that spot in terms of the three, four in this draft class? You, I mean, there are two different, you mean, like tack, nose tackles or uh, ends? Uh, in, mostly. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that, that's always a conversation, um, you know, in some respects, it's beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes you can, you know, guys that, that can play defensive end in a 4 3 or play defensive end in our system, or are you projecting that guy to be an outside linebacker in our system? If he's an outside linebacker, is he a guy that can be a pass rusher on third down? Maybe he can go put his hand down. So there's a lot of versatility in a lot of those players, and, and, it, and a lot of it just depends on, you know, what you're going to ask a guy to do. And that's one of the things that I, I really feel good about our, 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 our process at this point is we've got. Really specific ideas as to what our, what these guys will do when they come into our building and into our scheme, and that comes from a lot of conversation and a lot of you know a lot of emphasis on on making sure that as we evaluate from a scouting perspective and a coaching perspective that we use that you mark that's a fine. That's not me. That that's we a fine, use that's a fine for accusing. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> touche. Right. That we make sure that we're specific about what the guy's going to do when he comes into our building, and so I think that gives us a chance to, to really you know take players and be real you know clear about what they're going to do when they walk in the door. Great. Right, with your thir thirty pre-draft visits, what exactly? I mean, I mean you can't get into detail, but what what are those used for as, for your group and for the coaches? 
um, they're, they're multiplistic in, in, in use. I mean, some of them are, are guys that weren't combine guys that we don't have any real medical uh, data and, and information on and we want to get our doctors to put their hands on the guys. And so if, if we've got draftable grades on some of those guys, um, we'll bring them in and make sure that we get the medical piece covered, um, you know, just that we're being thorough that way. Some of them are, are recruiting visits for guys that we don't think are going to be drafted that we're talking to and we're saying, hey, look, this is what we see for you. and. And, and if we take you, then, then here's what you're going to do. And if, we, if not, then, then you know maybe we can compete for a free agent opportunity. Um, and then some of them are just that, you know you need you know, additional information. So you, we, we've had you know multiple opportunities to talk to these players, to, whether it's at All Star games and interviews, or or, or at the combine, or, or you know scouts going on campus and talking to them. Sometimes you don't get enough, and you need to bring them in, and you need to just you know I've said a lot. I describe this process as exhaustive because it has to be, because it's so important. Um, and you've got to make sure that you you leave no stone unturned with respect to your preparation so that on draft day you know what you're getting and there are no questions that you need to ask you know, while you're sitting there on the clock. So Rick, a part of this exhausting process, where does pro day fit in? Not exhausting, Mark. It doesn't, I'm not it's exhausted. No, I'm exhausted. Exhausted. How important is it? I owe him, so I'm going to get him, man. <laughs> Exhausted. How exhausting is the process? How exhausting. No, how, part, how important is pro day for everything amongst the things that you do? Yeah, again, another important, um, you know, I'll say ancillary you know, data point that, that we use in the whole process, but a very important one, just like the combine is very important. But, but the bulk of the evaluation, Mark, happens when you turn the film on and you watch the guy, what kind of football player he is, and that's the most important thing. And we, you know, we harp on that, that, that the, you know, the, the playing personality and the, and the resume that the guy puts on film is by far the most important thing that we look at. But then you've got to look at 40 times. You've got to look at the medical piece, and you've got to look at what he does at the pro day. And do you see progression? Um, you know, I'm big on careers. I like guys that have, you know, that have had careers. And so do you see the guy continuing to imp you know, improve, whether it's you saw the kid at an all-star game, and I don't like to call him a kid, but you saw the young man at an all-star game, you know, then you saw him obviously in his you know first in the season and at an All Star game, and then you saw him at the combine, and you see him at the pro day. Do you see progression? You know, is he continuing to get better? Because, you know, I tell these guys all the time when they come in for the visits. I, you know, one of the things that I talk to them about is is it's a, it's a it's an interesting time in their lives where most most times you don't get to the level of success that these guys have gotten to if they're not goal oriented. And so, the fact that they're goal oriented, one of the problems with that. And, me included, as goal-oriented people are, are, are very ambitious, they're very uh, driven, and so when they set a goal and they reach the goal, what do they do? They set another goal, right? So, you know, there are not a lot of times in your life where you get to really be in some real gratitude and thankful for, you know, all the work that you've done and, and what's about to happen for it. And so I talk to them about that perspective, but then I also remind them that as soon as this draft is over, the next week there's a rookie mini camp, and they go right back to the bottom and grind starts again. So, you know, you want to make sure that you see progression through the course of the spring so that when the guy shows up at rookie minicamp, he is what you, what you think he is. What do you consider a good batting average for a draft, and how long does it take to really know whether or not you had a good draft? Yeah, I, let, I kind of let you guys do the, the batting average kind of success thing. Right. I think it takes about two to three years. You know, there's some guys that, that, you know, when you take a guy in the first round, the expectation is that, there, especially when you're in the upper half of the first round, there's some impact that you want, right? And then as you move through the balance of the draft, we have defined, you know, one of the ways that we define how you take a guy, where you grade a guy on a grading scale, is what you think his success rate is going to be in the league. So if you take a guy in the first round, into that upper half, you, you expect him to make an impact. If it's the back half, you know, pretty, pretty quickly, right? Um, the back half, you expect that he'll be an impact player and a starter, and then the second round, you're thinking about a starter, and third round, you think, you know, so there, there, there are descriptions that we use. So for, for the, the entire draft, I think it takes some time, two, three years to see, but there are some guys that you want to see some immediate impact on. And so I think that's a, it's a, it's a complicated question, but it varies from where you take the guy, I think. You know. Rick, what does it say about Art Browse and Baylor that they're supposed to have the most players? Drafted for me in Texas schools. Well, he loves Baylor, doesn't he? <laughs> I want to ask you about Purdue, but I don't know if they're going to be Whoa, whoa, wow, wow. <laughs> wow. Boy, it's, it's the Mark and John show on Rick. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
here's what I would say. I, as, as important as this process is, John, for us, um, equally important for college football is the recruiting process. It is the lifeblood of college football. And so what it says to me is clearly Art and his staff, they're doing a great job of recruiting and developing players. And so, um, you know, he is, he's a heck of a football coach, and they've got a great program, great facilities. And, you know, we have a big presence at their pro day. And, and, and you're right, they've got a lot of good football players, and I, I think that will continue because I think he's an excellent recruiter. And I think they do a good job of, of, of developing players. Rick, in recent years, the Texans uh, haven't had seventh round, seventh round picks. Has this been a strategy to get after those undrafted kids early with the success you've had with Aaron Foster and other undrafted prospects? Yeah, I don't know if that was by design as much as it's just a function of, of movement, right? So we have two six round picks this year. We, you're right, we don't have a seven, uh, and that was just a function of, of, of making some moves during the course of the year to try to get our football team better. So it, it's not by design that we don't have them. Um, I, I, if we had a seventh pick or multiple seventh round picks, it wouldn't, you know, affect how aggressive and, and, and how organized and how important that college free agency process is. It's, it's hugely important um, because, as you know, we've talked about the fact that, you know, in the salary cap era, you have to have the draft and, and, and you know, college free agents round out your roster, and you want good football players, and so. Um, we put a lot of a lot of emphasis on that. We put a lot of um, time and effort on that. Um, you know, that's that that part of the process really. John Carr, Chris Olson, and uh, you know those guys. You know, the, the, the big stuff were, were Brian Gain and, 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 and myself and, and the coaches. You know, we're we're doing a lot of the, the 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 front, the top of the board. But that that free agency process that those and those guys do a lot of work and they get with the coaches and we have you know we've got a pretty. A detailed process that we use to pair coaches and scouts together, and, and uh, you know that's organized, and so it has to be because you know if you can hit on one or two of those guys, and, and we did last year, that, that that's really really you know, it's impactful for your team. Uh, one of the things you guys were able to do recently was to get a fifth year option exercise for DeAndre Hopkins. How important is that for the future? Just kind of your thoughts on you know, making sure that he's here for a long time. Yeah, uh, D-Hop is really, really uh, emerging into, you know, one of the better wide receivers in the league. And, and you're right, we exercise the option. So this isn't his last year. He's got another year under, under his contract. And, um, I just think that, you know, when you look at the way we built our football team, and, 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 you know, it starts with the draft, obviously, but we want to keep those players. Um, and, and I think we've done a decent job of doing that. So uh, he certainly is, is one of those guys that we're going to keep around there for a long time, hopefully. So, uh, you know, he's working hard. Why did you wait for your when you did rather than keep him around later? Well, I think I probably could have gotten a pick, John, you know, honestly. But I think in fairness to him, um, you know, we, we just thought, you know, and this was, a, this was an organizational decision. Everything that we do and when we do it, we, we, we have, you know, multiple conversations about it. And, um, you know, while... There, there may have been some value there for us organizational, and we just you know, felt like it was the right time to do it. And that not just for him, but for us as well. So it was just the right time we felt organizationally, and, and so we made the move. Uh, how much do you enjoy when you have that local day where you bring all the guys played or connected to Houston? You bring them in here. A lot of guys uh, that maybe you wouldn't see normally. Perhaps. How much? What do you think about that? Yeah, that, that's a that's a huge, huge thing for us. We've got you know, so many you know good football players here that, that have some local tie, um, and it's you know we we we've, we've had some success finding guys in that you know particular workout setting, and so I think they enjoy it. We enjoy it. You know, it's a time for us coaches to get out on the grass again and kind of work with 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 kind of, in, a, in a somewhat team like setting. We organize it that way, so that's fun. I enjoy watching that and. and just enjoy you know, getting another young athlete from around here. Uh, Rick, there's several top of the draft class players that have some medical issues. Uh, with Jadavion Clowney and his injury history, does that factor into some of the players you may or may not look at? No, I mean, everything is individual. You know, we, we're, you know we've got an outstanding medical staff. Our doctors, um, you know, trainers do a great job of, of identifying, you know, and grading the players and giving that information to us. And so we've got good information and good feelings on all the guys and and, um, and their medical grades. We'll take some guys off the board. Um, we, we'll understand the risk of some other guys. And, and so no, nothing that we've done before impacts that. 
brings it hard sometimes not to to be careful about putting too much emphasis on speed, especially because everybody loves speed. Is it, is it careful? About speed, sometimes to, to say compartmentalize it, make it part of the process instead of a big reason you took somebody. Well, I mean, it's like I said, you can't coach it, but, you know, if, if a guy can run fast but he can't play football, John, it doesn't make sense to, to, to have him on your football team. You know what I mean? And there's, 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 there is some benefit to speed, and, and certainly you want guys who can play ball and play fast and, and, you know, all those things. But you're right, you can't overvalue one particular characteristic, whether that is um, size, weight, speed, whatever. You can't overvalue it. And so speed is the same thing. I mean, there's some things that you, you can get away with if you can run. Um, but but you've also got to be able to change the direction. You've got to be able to think. You've got to be able to do all those other things that, that encompass a good football player. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's your favorite song? Yeah. I was thinking about that uh, yesterday. I think, uh, I don't know. I got so many. I would tell you the whole Purple Rain album I liked. That's where I got the purple socks off. <laughs> Just one, one quick question. Um, with the, uh, you said normally it takes two years for a draft to, to really weigh whether, how, whether, you know, evaluate how good it was. But that being said, last year's draft, a lot of those guys contributed early. Do you, do you think that was one of your better draft classes in, in recent years? Yeah, I don't know if it, if it was one of the better ones. What I will tell you is I think it's in, in indicative of what we described a little bit earlier in the sense that I think what we're doing at this point in the process is so good from the standpoint of evaluating what the guy's role and vision is for our team. So, for example, I'll give you a guy, Keith Mumphrey. You know, I think we took, maybe we even took some criticism because nobody really knew about Keith. We were the only team to go in and work him out, but we had a specific vision for what he could do for our team and he came in and he fulfilled that role. So that to me is why you look at you know, you know, our last couple of drafts, what we've been able to do is really hone in on these guys and really you know, have a clear vision of what they will do when they walk in and so they have a chance to play early. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.